Remember the joke? Um. <laughs> what is the downside to eating a clock? <sighs> it's time consuming. <laughs> That's so dumb. <laughs> Good night, kiddo. On the off chance that you've accidentally clicked onto this video by mistake, or didn't notice the spoiler warning, this is now your final warning. I will be talking major spoilers for The Last of Us Part 2, so if you haven't finished the game, then go do that and come back. Even if you've seen the leaks and don't care about spoilers, I'd still highly recommend seeing it for yourself, instead of listening to these ramblings of a madman. Of course, if you haven't finished the game and you still want to hear my thoughts, you can do so in my spoiler-free review, which you can find linked in the description below. Warnings are all out the way, so let's crack on. I won't really be touching on any gameplay mechanics or visuals, because I've pretty much covered all of that in my non-spoiler review. This will be mostly talk on the very controversial story that Neil Druckmann and his team at Naughty Dog treated us to. Let's start with one of the game's biggest talking points, and that's also one of the biggest complaints from some fans about the story, and that's Joel's death at the hands of new playable character, Abby. There's no getting away from how much this one hurts. Even with the leaks spoiling this big reveal for some, it doesn't soften the blow, no pun intended, of losing our main playable character from the first game so early in this sequel. Although this one was rough, it had to happen in order to get the amazing story we were given. Ellie's backstory already means she's dealing with a lot of mental demons, but witnessing this event obviously sends her off the deep end, driving her to go on this revenge mission which would eventually lead her to lose everything. In my non-spoiler review, I spoke about the use of some real life songs that really take this story to the next level. It's of course Joel's cover of Pearl Jam's Future Days, which I refer to. A piece of music that is so interwoven in with the game's story that it's impossible not to mention. It goes without saying that the opening lyrics of this song foreshadow the events of the entire game. If I ever were to lose you, I'd surely lose myself. Although it's Joel who originally sings this to Ellie in one of the game's early scenes, it's Ellie who sadly loses Joel and herself. The revenge mission she decides to go on results in her losing the love of her life Dina, who leaves Ellie and takes their child JJ with her. The father of that child, Jesse, also loses his life trying to help Ellie, and Tommy ends up a shell of his former self. She truly did lose herself after losing Joel, and it breaks this old man's heart. While I'm mentioning these characters, I just want to point out how incredibly well voice acted each one of them is. Hats off to Ashley Johnson, Troy Baker, Laura Bailey, Shannon Woodward, Stephen A. Chang, Jeffrey Pierce, and more for what was an outstanding performance. I understand that a lot of people strongly dislike a lot of this story, and that's fine. Personally, I think it's incredible and hard-hitting storytelling, which results in a game that will stick with me for a long time. I want to quickly address some of these complaints before moving on to speaking about Abby. The big criticism I keep hearing is just how dumb Joel and Tommy come off when they first meet Abby, quickly giving up their names and where they're from. I completely agree that this would never have happened in the first game. Joel would have likely left Abby to die or been more wary about her intentions. But this isn't the same Joel. It's so important to remember that four years have passed since the events of the first game and even more importantly, a lot has happened in those four years, or a lot hasn't happened I probably should say. Joel and Tommy have clearly been enjoying a safe and trouble-free lifestyle for a long time. I'm sorry, but that would change a person. 
I'm not saying that a part of the old Joel wouldn't still be there, but there's absolutely no doubt that after years of peaceful living, that he would let his guard down a bit and become more trusting having been surrounded by so many good people for so long. Especially when you compare the old Joel, who was continuously surrounded by down and out desperate people in the Boston quarantine zone. It could be hard to fathom this idea of a new Joel coming off the back of part one, but it didn't feel out of character to me. Especially as the game moves forward and we get more flashbacks to Joel's recent lifestyle, where the biggest stress he had to worry about was a homophobic barman and what to trade for coffee. I will admit that maybe they should have fleshed this out more before brutally murdering him, but come the end of the game, I felt they had done a great job in justifying their actions at the beginning. Uh, those people that came through last week. Oh. I'm a little embarrassed as to what I had to trade to get it, but it's not bad. Moving on from Joel, let's talk about the woman who ended his life, Abby. It felt like a very typical Naughty Dog move to have us play as Joel's killer before the murder takes place. This would have been cool just for the shock factor, but then the game reaches its halfway point and we once again take control of Abby, just as Ellie finally catches up with her. The fact that the game makes us play as Abby for half the story is a controversial move which many do not like. There's no doubt that Abby is difficult to warm to, but I felt that if you stick with it and stay open-minded, then you are rewarded with a character who is just as easy to connect to as Ellie. I think what may have turned off a lot of players to Abby's side of the game is how obvious Naughty Dog's intentions are. Straight away you feel forced to care about the killer of our favourite character and forget about the hours and hours we've just put into Ellie's mission to kill the character that we're now in control of. There's no denying how jarring this change is and I've seen a lot of people ditch the game at this point. I'm not going to chastise these folks as I completely understand that feeling. I had it as well, but there was no way I wasn't going to see this story through. Then something happened. I began to care about Abby's story. The war between the wolves and the Seraphites was engaging and her backstory with Owen and his adorable aquarium was all of a sudden enough to keep me invested. At this point though, I still didn't like Abby. Given that her father was murdered by Joel, I definitely sympathised with her but that didn't mean I had to like her. Then after being captured by the Seraphites and meeting Yara and Lev, that began to change. Her relationship with these two characters, particularly Lev, was the turning point for Abby, which made me not only like this character, but also question my actions as Ellie to this point. Yes, I realized that this was the writer's obvious intentions, which they wore clearly on their sleeve, but that doesn't stop it from working. Just because you can see the end, doesn't mean the journey there can't be brilliant, and this one is just that. I love the relationship between Abby and Lev. So much they even began to reflect the one between Joel and Ellie for me. It was at this point that I'd gone from playing as Ellie in the first half, wanting to kill any wolf member who got in my way so that I could brutally get revenge on Abby, to now hoping for some sort of resolution that meant both characters could survive, given that I now cared for them equally. It meant that the two main boss fights in the game were difficult and uncomfortable to play. Playing as Abby trying to kill Ellie was just horrible. I didn't enjoy a single second of it, but I can't help but feel that's the point. You're not meant to want Ellie dead, but your hand is being forced. Though I will admit to resenting her a lot for killing Alice, Mel and Owen. They deserve better, damn it. I'm still not sure whether this Ellie boss fight is a good thing or not. Overall, I think it helped me view these two characters on an even playing field but I hated playing every second of it and would often let Ellie defeat me as I thought that's what I wanted. What really took me by surprise was the final boss fight where you're back in control of Ellie in an effort to finally get revenge and kill Abby. Even after coming round to Abby and enjoying her as a character, I genuinely thought I'd have no problem controlling Ellie and completing her mission. It turns out though, that it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be and I'd severely underestimated how much Abby had meant to me. It was exactly like the Ellie boss fight where I just didn't feel comfortable with what I had to do. I didn't want to break apart the relationship between Abby and Lev like Abby did for Joel and Ellie. I didn't want Abby dead anymore. Thankfully, neither did Ellie. In what was weirdly a happy ending. <laughs> Ellie's last minute decision to spare Abby 
may be seen as an odd one to some, and I can see why. Remember though, this is a very troubled and broken young woman. Her last second realisation that killing Abby won't make the pain of flashbacks to Joel go away was a good enough reason for me to spare her. It shows that Ellie isn't completely lost to revenge and hatred, and leaves a tiny bit of hope that she may be able to live a somewhat normal life again if she ever catches up with Dina. I have absolutely no issue with people not digging this last minute bait and switch, but given how much death we've been put through, how much I'd come round to Abby and not wanting Ellie to completely lose herself to all this, I happily took this weird ending with a dash of hope. The final scene with Ellie in her empty farmhouse having lost everything is heartbreaking enough, but to then pull out Joel's trusty guitar that he had gifted to her, which we as the player has been strumming away on through the entire game, and have Ellie not be able to play Joel's song anymore due to losing her fingers in that final battle is nothing short of devastating. It's at this point where she has truly lost everything. It's sad, it's depressing, but it's a brilliant story which I'll never forget. Before I wrap up, I always want to quickly speak directly to the minority of people who have left a few negative reviews revolving around the game being too woke, with Ellie being a proudly open gay protagonist and Lev coming out as trans. One, we've known Ellie is gay since the Left Behind DLC. I assume you just chose to ignore that, yeah? And the way they handle Lev's situation is done with such nuance and respect to what the character is going through that you can't help but warm to him in the biggest way. And two, if you're upset by this, then feel free to fuck off and never read or watch any of my content in the future, you ignorant homophobic prick. I hid him. I was so stupid. Needless to say, my score hasn't changed from my first review. I'm still at a 10 with no sign of changing my mind anytime soon. Is it flawless? No, but what is? Can you find plot holes? Maybe, but it's never enough to derail this incredible story. I will address more reasonable criticisms directly in a video that me and Matt have recorded. To be honest, it's probably already up on a YouTube channel. Have a search, you'll probably find it. Thank you for watching this spoiler-filled review of The Last of Us Part 2. Given this is a spoiler video, I assume you've already finished the game. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below and give me your review out of 10 and I'll get back to you. Maybe you didn't like the game. That's cool. Let me know. Also, for more great Last of Us content and loads of other great nerdy video game stuff, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. And for all the latest news and reviews and the written version of this review, make sure to check out respawning.co.uk. Once again, thank you for watching. I've been Mikey, and I'll catch you next time.